Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andy Brewer. I'm going to give you a bit of information about our lake restoration program uh, within Rotorua. We're based in uh, the North Island of New Zealand. Um, my outline is going to be giving you some background, talk to you about our science support and the special relationship that we have there with the University of Waikato, uh, tell you something about our program structure and funding, which is important to make the program happen, uh, and then talk about a specific intervention of alum use within our program and draw some conclusions from that. So just a little bit of background, our program's around 12 lakes, they depicted there in the satellite image, and these lakes started off ranging from uh, eutrophic right through to some very high quality oligotrophic lakes. Um, the lake area is about 30 hectares to 8,000 hectares for Lake Rotorua. In the uh, early to mid 1990s, we started to see this situation, some beautiful lakes turning into uh, health hazards, uh, getting health warnings, uh, algal blooms starting to appear and the community really wasn't so happy about that. Um, what we wanted to really establish and for the community to understand is where were the nutrients coming from and so the focus has been pretty much until 19... 90s, uh, early 1990s on sorting out sewage around the city, perhaps not all the lakeside communities were articulated at that time, but we'd overlooked the uh, impact of land use and farming and the development of land use around uh, some of our catchments. Uh, people always overlook the natural inputs or residual inputs from forestry and uh, from uh, native bush. And within our area, we have geothermal inputs which carry uh, uh, phosphorus and, uh, and, and nitrogen. Uh, and then uh, people understand that uh, the nutrients can be held in the bottom sediments of a lake, but they really don't understand the processes of release uh, of that from the sediments. So what's really useful to have a look at here is what's the magnitude of these inputs? And I've highlighted in red there pasture, because pasture brings in Pastoral farming within the catchment of Lake Rotorua itself, our largest lake, brings in about 74% of the nitrogen and about 44% of the phosphorus on an annual basis. Uh, lifestyle and urban, because of sewage reticulation and treatment, the levels are significantly lower, about 8% respectively. And then we have some uh, geology and some geothermal inputs that bring in, uh, in a specific area, quite a high percentage of nitrogen you a 5% there, but that's coming in at one, mostly at one particular location. And then um, uh, phosphorus, about 36% coming in from, uh, from springs and geothermal activity. We then go down to the, the uh, pinky line down there about sediment releases, and you can see that these releases of nitrogen uh, in Lake Rotorua, if it, if it loses its bottom water oxygen and becomes stratified, um, can be around about half of what comes from the catchment and getting on for a, about the same amount of phosphorus that comes from the catchment um, being released from the sediments uh, in a year. So um, it's important to consider those um, inputs from sets and, and investigate how we can deal with those. Moving on to the next issue is uh, uh, groundwater age. And for Lake Rotorua, the catchment's depicted there uh, by the, um, the coloured areas. And the average groundwater age in Lake Rotorua uh, catchment is about 60 years. So what's really important to understand is that if you make any changes to land use, improve land use, change land use within that catchment to a lower nutrient footprint, it's going to take on average about 60 years before that impact gets to the lake. Of course, there's some catchments where it's faster, and there's some catchments in the pitch you'll see there where it's longer, at uh, even 127 years. So really, as a result of that, we're looking at uh, interventions that will uh, more rapidly uh, improve water quality, and this uh, depicts some of those there. And one of them is uh, phosphorus locking or alum dosing in streams, which I'll describe uh, shortly. Uh, the diversion wall, which diverts water from one lake uh, which has uh, intensive land use around it, uh, away from the uh, second lake directly to a uh, river outlet which goes relatively rapidly to the sea. 
Our sewage reticulation of lakeside communities, you can see there a lot of communities quite close to the lake and typically they've had septic tanks with discharged groundwater. And then uh, we've got a geothermal flow or input which uh, carries uh, quite a level of nitrogen which we're working out how we deal with currently. In terms of sediments, um, the diagram there shows the outline of Lake Rotorua and then the red area depicts the deeper parts of the lake uh, where the uh, phosphorus levels in the sediments are higher than other parts of the lake. And we really investigated early on whether we could cap that with alum or other products that cap uh, uh, phosphorus in lake sediments or whether we should be doing aeration or whether we should be dredging those areas. Um, some trial work which we've done on a smaller lake uh, as is depicted in the picture there, Lake Okaro, about a 30 hectare lake. And I'm not going to describe that because Professor Hamilton from the University of Waikato has already described that in much more detail in his presentation uh, earlier in the conference. We've also done work, uh, trial work, looking at aeration as a method of um, preventing nutrient releases from sediments. Uh, where we're really heading for is looking at what's the sustainable land use around some of these catchments. And this is um, a depiction of the ranges of nitrate leaching from various land uses. And uh, you'll see that even uh, bush and forestry has a residual uh, nitrogen leaching uh, footprint, uh, but much lower than sh uh, sheep and deer, and it's considerably lower than dairy farming. Uh, dairy farming within New Zealand is a very profitable uh, land use and it's attracting a lot of um, attention uh, for farmers to convert the dairy, to dairy farming. Uh, within some of our lakes catchments, we have that under control in terms of uh, rules to prevent uh, farmers increasing their nutrient footprint from their farming activity. But what you do see if you look at the dairy farming uh, leaching coefficient there between 28 and 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare was potential to improve management within a dairy farm come to the lower end of that scale. And there's also the potential to convert um, dairy farming to other uh, lower nutrient leaching practices. What I wanted to really talk about, uh, and this is the science support that we have and the special relationship that we have with the University of Waikato. Uh, the university is about an hour away from our city and uh, we fund a chair in lake water quality uh, research with Professor David Hamilton at the university. So he's a key um, a component of our program and science advisor, alongside the other people who are in our water technical advisory group, including people from uh, Crown Research Institutes, such as uh, NIWA, uh, GNS Science, and Scion. I wanted to um, highlight, I think, some of the work that the university's done and some of the tools that the university's given us uh, to assist us in, in managing our program. And so I've just highlighted three really significant things that uh, contribute really heavily to our program. And the first of those is uh, high frequency monitoring buoys. Uh, and these are located on four of our lakes so far. Uh, and they give 24-7 um, information about the meteorology um, on each of the lakes and also a range of water quality parameters which are monitored right through the water column. And these can be seen on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council's website with, with our live monitoring. So anyone can link into those from anywhere in the world if you've got access to the World Wide Web. That brings us on to the decision support uh, work that we get from the university and the other CRIs around uh, our modelling. And this is particularly looking at what happens if we change uh, land use, uh, what happens if we do some interventions within a lake, and what's the outcome we're likely to see that we can pass on to our community and to our politicians so they can make decisions as to what options they select. And the really important thing here is we're bringing together catchment models, uh, things like climate models and data from our um, high frequency monitoring to be able to run um, ecological models and hydrodynamic models, which, as I say, are the things that help uh, our community make the decisions around uh, what interventions are necessary to achieve the water quality standards. And then the third thing I was going to um, show to you here is the use of satellite imagery that the university's developed for us here. 
And you can see by these pictures that you simply couldn't have that level of monitoring from a, a, a daily, uh, a weekly or a monthly monitoring program and the um, spatial resolution is, is um, really fantastic um, for us to understand what's going on um, in the lakes with various different parameters. And it's really useful for uh, our community to be able to see this sort of graphics to understand what's going on. The image on the uh, right hand side really zeroes in on the diversion wall and shows how the wall is um, effectively stopping water from Lake Rotorua reaching the blue area of Lake Rotoiti and it's being diverted um, clearly down the Kaituna River. Another really important aspect of the program is the structure and the funding because without the structure, without the funding, um, really a lot of stuff wouldn't happen. And so we have uh, on the left hand side the governance group which comprises the three um, partners, the Rotorua District Council, the local um, city council, uh, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, so that's the, for the whole Bay of Plenty region, and the Tiarawa Lakes Trust who are the owners of the lake beds. And so they are a governance group and they're the decision makers who um, uh, support the science and the actions around their program to re restore the 12 lakes. Then on the right hand side of the um, slide there you'll see I've broken the program down into about three basic areas. So we're, we're very much an action based program and we're very reliant on the science uh, from our support team um, to help us decide on what are the appropriate actions and to, I guess, monitor the success of those actions. I mentioned earlier on the short and the long term thing and that really relates to things like groundwater age. So we are effectively wanting to uh, convert our catchments into sustainable catchments and find sustainable land uses that protect the water quality of those lakes. But that's going to take some time and so we have in-lake interventions, in-lake and in-stream interventions which will accelerate that improvement in our lakes. And then the funding stream there is it's about a $230 million pro dollar program over a period of uh, 10 to 15 years. And our three main sources of funding are the district council where they fund um, the sewage schemes with the support from the from the regional council and uh, from uh, uh, the, the central government. And uh, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council basically uh, funds all of the inlake interventions. And then we have an agreement with the Crown uh, or central government to fund about $72 million uh, into our program that supports all sorts of specific actions, which um, I have mentioned some of those, but I won't go into the detail of that just at the moment. So then I wanted to go into one specific restoration technique that we use, and that's uh, the use of alum sulfate. And uh, this is quite regularly used in other countries, particularly in parts of the United States and some parts of Europe for lake restoration. We use it in two different ways and uh, I'll talk about the lake dosing that we do on the right hand side of the slide first and that's pretty much similar to what's done uh, in many countries overseas. Uh, we've got a couple of lakes where we do that on uh, about an area of 30 hectares and so we're dosing um, intermittent doses of uh, alum by a boat or barge into the lake to address um, uh, summer releases of uh, phosphorus and uh, prevent those releases from the sediments coming up into the surface waters. We've had some success with this program but there's still um, intermittent uh, issues around algal blooms and the universities recently identified for us that uh, one of the issues is possibly um, once the algal bloom starts to occur the pH of the lake gets so high and sometimes as high as 10 to 10.5 units, um, then the alum will have no ability to, to hold on to the phosphorus and so um, it's being released and allowing the algal growth. But the area that I think is really interesting here is a different way that we use uh, alum uh, and we dose it into some uh, streams contributing to two of our lakes. So we have three plants, three alum dosing plants and I'll show you in a minute what they look like. 
that we dose at a rate of about one part per million into those streams 24 7 and at the peak of our dosing in 2011 we dosed into Lake Rotorua about 110 tons of aluminium over that one year period uh, we initially were focused on locking up phosphorus coming down the streams as a kickstart to our program getting some of the catchment phosphorus out but because of the success we've had in uh, dosing alum uh, for locking up the phosphorus we've transferred the control uh, protocol uh, into the lake and so now we have a dosing protocol which really says if uh, if thin lake phosphorus is getting below uh, 17 parts per billion then we turn the alum dosing down and if it gets over 20 per parts per billion we turn the aluminium up so it's a little bit like um, controlling uh, a pot on a gas element um, to remain uh, just simmering and if it boils too hard we turn the gas down if it uh, starts to go off the boil then we turn the gas up and of course in this situation the gas is aluminium sulfate our response rate uh, that the technical advisory group believes we're getting is around about a one to seven uh, phosphorus to aluminium uh, response. Um, another really important part of this program is our ecological monitoring um, to ensure that we aren't doing something to the ecology uh, in the areas where we're dosing or in the lakes that are receiving um, flow from those streams. So we have uh, ecological monitoring around the streams uh, into the lake as well as we've done some uh, uh, chronic um, testing using alum on some of our native species in uh, trials that have run for um, two months and uh, to establish the uh, possible impacts on, on some of our native species. This is what the phosphorus looking, uh, phosphorus locking plants look like. Um, there's a slide on the left hand side there shows a, an alum tank and then inside the, the uh, control room there is the dosing equipment and uh, on the right hand side you can see a small green dosing pump that's the heart of the equipment that controls the dose rate and that pumps uh, aluminium sulfate out to a diffuser into a stream um, close to the uh, dosing plant here. These are not high cost about yeah, two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars capital to um, build them, but they can be high cost in terms of running, depending on how much alum you use. And so we've dosed between five hundred thousand to about nine hundred thousand dollars of uh, aluminium sulfate in any one year. Now, from that, we want to move on and have a look what that's doing to phosphorus. And so this graph here, running from two thousand and three right up to the middle of last year. Um, shows total phosphorus concentration in the lake uh, by the blue dots and you can see the seasonal um, spikes in, in phosphorus throughout that time period. Then the red line and the blue line depict when uh, alum sulfate uh, started to be dosed at the two sites going into Lake Rotorua. So the red line started in 2006 and the blue line started in 2010 and you can see that by the middle to the end of 2010 with those high levels of aluminium uh, sulfate dosing we had phosphorus levels pretty well under control and we weren't getting uh, the peaks in phosphorus that you've experienced seasonally in the past. If we go down to a finer scale here uh, and I want to look particularly at the right hand side of this graph where you see uh, phosphorus, total phosphorus levels are pretty low but there's one little um, spike in uh, total phosphorus there. And what happened at that time uh, is uh, one of the alum plants uh, had a fault and we had to close it down for a period of time. And uh, the technical advisory group is looking at that dot and saying, because we lowered the alum dosing rate, then there is uh, a potential that uh, if we were to do that again, we could see these um, phosphorus spikes come up quite rapidly. So that's just a little bit of a warning to us that we need to be very careful about how we turn uh, this plant down and how long that effect might last if we were to stop dosing. 
Then finally, if we have a look on this slide here, this is basically 2013 alum dosing and the uh, phosphorus concentrations over a one, two and three month uh, average. And it just shows you that we've got the, the level of phosphorus and total phosphorus in the lake now in the range of about 15 to 20 um, parts per billion. And so we're in a range where that lake is likely to uh, be very um, high quality water. If I flick over now, then this is the result of column dosing. This is Lake Rotorua. And so you can see the clarity of that water. That's not particularly deep water, of course. It's about half a metre deep, but you can see there isn't any algae present. Um, and it's, uh, it's a nice quality of water there on the shore of uh, our city. Um, but I've put the title on there, but with risks, and you might think the risks are um, if we dose alum into the environment, what's then an ecological effect? And of course, as I said earlier, we're monitoring that and we're very mindful that, that we could come criticised uh, for dosing alum if there were um, any ecological impacts. But the risk I'm really referring to here is that we may well have done such a good job that uh, if we're not careful, the community, in particular landowners, may lose an appetite for um, improving land use and improving their uh, farming practices because they uh, perceive that we've solved the problem. And uh, unless we continue dosing alum, there may be a risk uh, that we have not solved the problem. So really, in summary, the main points there, it's a 12 lake program. Some of them are beautiful lakes, some of them are eutrophic, even a, a one a super eutrophic lake. Uh, we're really mindful of the role of sediments and uh, driving algal blooms and bringing phosphorus back into the water column through recycling. Uh, groundwater delays have an impact on our program because they've had uh, short and long term interventions, and, and we have to make some decisions about how we deal with. Um, uh, improvements in water quality over the short and long term. We're very, very reliant on the science feeding into our program for decision making and to give the community um, the confidence that um, we are doing the right things in terms of um, interventions to improve water quality. Um, and they help advise and provide some of the key restoration tools and, uh, and Alum is one of those. We have a number of other tools, but I haven't got time to mention all those uh, today. Uh, the program structure and funding is, is fundamental to anything happening. Without a, a good structure uh, and without the funding to do things, then um, we could just be sitting here monitoring the decline of water quality in our lakes. And um, fortunately, we're in a position where we are monitoring the improvement in a number of our lakes. And the bottom line here is the community wants to see success. So the program that they're paying for that, that is successful and they're starting to see that. 